Good morning. This is Marshall Davis. Lent is coming up on the Christian calendar. It begins Ash Wednesday, which this year falls on February 14th, which is also Valentine's Day. So I guess I ought to be talking about Lent and love, but I will leave that topic for a blog post, and here I'll stick to Lent. In this episode, I want to deal with a topic that is important to Christians, especially during Lent, but it's not talked about very much in non-dual circles. The subject is repentance. It is badly misunderstood. Now, I've talked about repentance before in a non-dual context, but I have not dedicated an entire episode to it, so I'm going to do that today. The call to repent is normally talked about in moral and ethical terms. But that is just the surface of it. When we follow it to its end, repentance is a path to spiritual awakening. It is a door to what Jesus calls the kingdom of God, which is unity of awareness. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Christians talk about repentance a lot, but it's almost entirely described as a change of heart that brings about a change of behavior. And that is certainly part of it. I mean, Christianity has it right as far as it goes. It just does not go far enough. Moral behavior is important in the spiritual life. The Buddha knew that. He knew the importance of right living, which is why in his first sermon he gave not only the Four Noble Truths, but he gave the Eightfold Path, which is how to live our lives rightly. It includes eight areas of rightness to get right, including right speech, and right conduct, and right livelihood, and so forth. But it's dualistic, having to do with right and wrong. And it is temporal, not eternal. Moral requirements change with time and culture. Even the commandments gra grave engraved in stone. Although Christians do not like to admit that. For example, one of the Ten Commandments is not to do any work on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. But there are very few Christians who will observe that commandment, even though it is listed as one of God's top ten, even when they move the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. They still don't observe it. Christians do all kinds of work, for pay or not, on their Sabbath. Now there is divorce, which Jesus talks about a lot. It used to be taboo in churches. Now... It is common among Christians as, as those that don't have any religion. Still, there are some behaviors that most cultures and religions agree are wrong. Our, cult our conscience, which is formed by our culture and family, convicts us when we violate these social norms. And to remove the emotional dissonance, we confess... We repent, we ask for forgiveness, and in return we are hopefully granted forgiveness by society and by those we have wronged, including one's relationship with a personal theistic God, if that's part of the religion. Moral repentance is a path that restores emotional well-being and social relationships. But that's as far as it goes. But we have to go deeper. I was reading the, the Gospel of Luke yesterday, where Jesus tells his disciples, in fact, there's a story when Jesus was calling his disciples, those disciples who were fishermen. And he tells those, those fishermen to cast their nets in deeper water. Launch out into the deep, Jesus told Simon Peter. And let down your nets for a catch. That's what we need to do. We need to cast our nets in deeper water, spiritually, to
To do that, we have to investigate the meaning of the word repent that is used in the Gospels. Now you have heard me explain this before, but I'm going to go into it in more depth today. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. It has several meanings which correspond to different levels of repentance. And one is certainly moral, it has to do with a change in behavior, it means to turn around, to change direction, to do a U-turn. Our lives are headed in one direction, morally, and we turn around and we head in the opposite direction, physically, as far as our behavior is concerned. But it has a deeper meaning than behavior. It's also a call to self-inquiry. We turn around 180 degrees and we examine ourselves. Not only examine our behavior, but our hearts. Jesus spends a lot of time talking about this dimension in the Sermon on the Mount. He directs people to examine deeper than they're used to. He says, for example, that the commandment not to kill is just about not doing physical harm. It's a matter, he says, of violence in the heart. Anger and hate, even if it never erupts into action. And it goes even deeper than that, self-inquiry does. We look at exactly who is doing this behavior. We ask the question, who am I? That's what Jesus points to when he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? The answer that Simon Peter gave was the Christ, which is true if you understand what the Christ means. But the answer that Jesus gave over and over again in his teachings was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am, he said. The Delphic Oracle was said to have the engraved over the entrance the inscription, Know Thyself. Socrates famously said that the unexamined life is not worth a living. He got himself executed by the good citizens of Athens for teaching the youth of Athens to examine themselves. Who am I? That's the question that Ramana Maharshi famously asked of his followers and is commonly known today as the, as the basic non-dual method. To ask that question is repentance. Not morally, but spiritually. Going beyond morality to identity. Is to stop looking outward at the external world and look inward and ask who is asking the question, who am I? Is to do 180 degree turn. We turn around and we look at who is looking. That's the heart of non-dual self-inquiry. That's the heart of repentance. And if followed to the end, it takes us beyond the mind, beyond the self. The word for repentance in the New Testament, metanoia, is formed of two smaller words, and it literally means beyond the mind. It takes us to a deeper level in self-inquiry. In self-inquiry, we examine all the possibilities for what we are, and we discover that we are not any of these. And we discover we are not even the mind that is asking these things. Most of us identify with the mind and with the body. It doesn't take too much to realize we're not the body, but it takes longer to realize we are not the mind. We're not our emotions, and we are not our thoughts. To see who we are, we have to go beyond the mind. And when we do that, we see that we are not the mind. We're not the psyche. We're not the self. We're not even consciousness. We go beyond, or you could say beneath, consciousness. Now this is where I have found I sometimes lose people. People are very attached to consciousness 
and they think they are consciousness. And I have tried to show how non-dual awareness is not the same as consciousness. But people disagree. So today I'm going to quote Nisagatata. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think I am. He explains it much better than I have. So if you want to argue this point, argue it with him and look to see what he has to say. Let me, let me read this uh, dialogue. The questioner asks, what do you do when asleep? Nisagata Maharaj says, I am aware of being asleep. Is not sleep a state of unconsciousness? He says, yes, I am aware of being unconscious. Hear that? And when awake or dreaming? I am aware of being awake or dreaming. Questioner says, you use the words aware and conscious. Are they not the same? And Nisagata says, awareness is primordial. It is the original state, beginningless, be beginningless, endless, uncaused, unsupported, without parts, without change. Consciousness is on contact a reflection against the surface, a state of duality. There can be no consciousness without awareness, but there can, there can be awareness without consciousness as in deep sleep. Awareness is absolute. Consciousness is relative to its content. Consciousness is always of something. Consciousness is partial and changeful. Awareness is total, changeless, calm, and silent. It is the common matrix of every experience. That's the end of the quote. To go beyond the mind, to repent, is to go, to go beyond consciousness and abide in that from which consciousness arises. That is non dual awareness. And that awareness is what we are always, in all dualities, whether conscious or unconscious, whether dream dreaming or in dreamless sleep. And we all know this at that deep level, intuitively. When we wake up in the morning, we know that we did not cease to be during those times when we were not dreaming. We know that we are, even when we are unconscious. The same with what we are before the birth of the body and after the death of the body, although there really is no before or after, because they're, they're all now. With the body or without the body, we are awareness. True repentance, properly understood, brings us to this realization. We turn around and we look for what we are, self-inquiry, and in the process we see everything we are not and that which remains, which is nothing as far as the mind is concerned, is what we are. You know, I know that I'm not this and this and this and this, and yet I am. Which means I am no self. Knowing this, realizing this, is spiritual awakening. This is the kingdom of God. And that is it for today. Grace and peace to you.